together words in an orderly and pleasing manner when we write. As I stated, composition is an art. Hence, it requires a certain measure of creativity for which no amount of mechanical rules can compensate. I believe that the best way to learn to write is not to follow a list of rules, but to study examples of great writing for all their worth, to pour over them, to analyze them by breaking them down into their component parts, examining how they are fitted together and what makes them tick. By so doing, our profiting shall be twofold. Not only will we have gained valuable insight into the mechanics of good writing, but we will have also imbibed some of that creative spirit which inspired the author himself, and without which we cannot hope to write well. So tonight I want to take a look at a model of great writing with which all of us are familiar, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. First we'll consider Lincoln's preparation as a writer. Then we'll look at how he went about composing his speech to see what we can learn about the writing process. Finally, we'll turn our attention to the speech itself to see what we can discover about the characteristics of good writing. And it is my hope that by the time we're through, we will have gleaned something that we can then take back and impart to our students. First, however, I think it would be well to refresh our minds as to the circumstances which led to Lincoln's composing these immortal words. On the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd of July in 1863, the bloodiest battle of the Civil War was fought in a little town in Pennsylvania called Gettysburg. More than 51,000 men, north and south, were killed or wounded in those three days of bloody fighting. The stakes were high. If the Southern Army had been victorious at Gettysburg, they might have then turned on Philadelphia, Baltimore, and even Washington, and the South may have won its independence and our nation been permanently rent in two. But as it turned out, the Southern Army was defeated and the Battle of Gettysburg became the turning point of the war in favor of the Union. In the days and weeks that followed the battle, there remained the gruesome task of burying the dead. The mangled corpses, bloated from the fierce July heat, lay scattered everywhere, as were the swollen bodies of thousands of dead horses. Soon the stench became unbearable, and to keep from gagging, the townspeople held smelling salts, or sticks of camphor, under their noses. At first, an attempt was made to box the bodies and ship them to their families, but after boxing 700 of them, the volunteers gave up. Finally, it was decided to purchase a plot of ground on the very battlefield to serve as a national cemetery for the fallen men. In September, the committee in charge invited the great orator, Edward Everett, to speak at the dedication ceremony scheduled for October. However, Everett needed more time to prepare, so the date was postponed to November 19th. As an afterthought, the truth was they were afraid he wouldn't know how to conduct himself on such a solemn occasion, they invited President Lincoln to come and make what they termed a few appropriate remarks to formally set up the grounds. At noon on November 18th, Lincoln's train pulled out of Washington, arriving in Gettysburg at dusk. The next morning the ceremonies began with a long procession of dignitaries led by President Lincoln on horseback. When all things were ready, Edward Everett launched into his two-hour oration, which, incredibly, he recited from memory. When he closed, the, cloud, the crowd applauded enthusiastically. Then a hymn was sung, and President Lincoln was introduced. Slowly, he rose to his feet and stepped to the edge of the platform, and in his shrill, raspy voice, delivered his few appropriate remarks. Let us read them aloud together. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But, in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, 
to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. When Lincoln sat down after speaking only two minutes, the crowd, expecting another lengthy speech, was bewildered. There was an awkward silence which gave way to brief, lukewarm applause. Lincoln sensed the crowd's disappointment and remarked to his friend, Ward Lehman, Lehman, that speech won't scour. It is a flat failure. The speech's cool reception by the crowd was nothing compared with the icy reviews it received in the papers the next day. Many of the papers were anti-Lincoln and never approved of anything, he said. The Chicago Times, for instance, had this to say about the speech. The cheek of every American must tingle with shame as he reads the silly, flat, and dishwatery utterances of the man who has to be pointed out to intelligent foreigners as the President of the United States. Other papers, however, praised Lincoln's words. One editor predicted that they would live among the annals of men, and how right he was. Today, the Gettysburg Address is regarded as the most famous speech in American history. It has been memorized by millions of American schoolchildren, and its message continues to inspire every new generation of Americans. As one historian noted, it will live as long as democracy itself. How could Abraham Lincoln, the son of an illiterate cabinet maker, compose such a brilliant masterpiece? Let us consider Lincoln's preparation as a writer to see if we can learn the answer. We all know that Lincoln was a voracious reader in his youth, that he would read any book he could get his hands on, that he would walk miles just to borrow a book, and that he would often read by the firelight into the wee hours of the night. Reading and writing go hand in hand, and you will scarcely find a good writer who is not also an avid reader. Aside from gaining new knowledge and a broader perspective, when reading, our minds absorb the thought patterns of skillful writers, which we then unconsciously reproduce when we write. We can see this principle demonstrated in Lincoln's life. More than any other book, he read the Bible. It was the sole book his family owned when he was growing up, and when he became a man, he continued to spend time alone each morning, reading passages from the scriptures. Therefore, it is not surprising that the Gettysburg Address has a biblical ring to it. His opening phrase, four score and seven years ago, harkens back to the Old Testament, as do such words as dedicate, consecrate, and hallow. The way he couples words together throughout the speech is likewise reminiscent of the style of the biblical writers. And when in closing he speaks of a new birth of freedom, that is, a, that is a term taken directly out of the New Testament. In addition to the Bible, scholars have identified words and phrases in the speech from other great works which Lincoln studied as well. The term proposition, for instance, is from Euclid's geometry, and the phrase all men are created equal is, of course, borrowed from the Declaration of Independence. Furthermore, there are traces of Pericles' funeral oration and Mason Weems' Life of Washington to be found in the address. So we can readily see that as writers, to a great extent, we are what we read. If we want to see our students' writing improve, then we must encourage them to read more. But I must add a word of caution. In Lincoln's day, books were scarce, and the only ones to be had were ones worth reading. Today, however, there is a glut of reading material on the market. And, sad to say, most of it, even children's literature, is unfit for young minds. Lincoln read the works of great men, and he was inspired to do great deeds. But so much of today's literature is the product of worldly, corrupt, or at best mediocre minds, and will only serve to stifle or limit the potential of our students. To illustrate the effect this kind of literature has on young people, I want to read from a book report one of my students wrote recently. I like party boys because they speak like this, and then blank. We have to go to that blank guy. Let's take our guns along and shoot him. That old weirdo, that dumb guy. 
Let's go shoot him right on the dock that he's standing right now. Let's go shoot him, then we can carry him away. If there is anything left with the shreds, we better go home and get more bullets. Then we have to go find someone else. Parents, I would encourage you to go home and make diligent search for any questionable literature. And if you find it, to burn it to ashes. Teachers and board members, I would encourage you to do the same with books at school. And then make a rule that any books brought to school must first be approved by the teacher. Let us guard the pure minds of our children from such trash, remembering the Savior's warning that it would be better to have a millstone hung about our necks and to be drowned in the depths of the sea than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. But it is not enough merely to encourage our children to read good books if we want them to write well. We must also see to it that they are firmly grounded in the principles of grammar. We all know that Lincoln was for the most part self-educated, having attended school only about a year. His knowledge of grammar was derived chiefly from studying a book called Kirkham's Grammar, a copy of which, minus its cover, I was fortunate to pick up at a book sale for only 50 cents. It contains all that anyone would need to know about English grammar in order to write well, yet it can be held in the palm of your hand and is barely half an inch thick. Compare that with the stack of workbooks our children are made to labor through over the course of eight years. I think we are making a serious mistake when we water down, or should I say dumb down, the truth to make it more palatable to our students. Rather than expecting students to thoroughly master one principle at a time, line upon line, order upon order, we run the whole gamut by them year after year in hopes that it will sink in by the time they graduate. But let me read you what this book has to say about the way to study grammar. The path which leads to grammatical excellence is not all the way smooth and flowery, but in it you will find some thorns interspersed and some obstacles to be surmounted. Or, in simple language, you will find in the pursuit of this science many intricacies which it is rather difficult for the juvenile mind completely to unravel. I shall therefore, as I proceed, address you in plain language and endeavor to illustrate every principle in a manner so clear and simple that you will be able, if you exercise your mind, to understand its nature. Should you ever have any doubts concerning the meaning of a word or the sense of a sentence, you should not be discouraged, but persevere either by studying my explanations or by asking some person competent to inform you till you obtain a clear conception of it and till all doubts are removed. By carefully examining and frequently reviewing the following lectures, you will soon be able to discern the grammatical construction of our language and fix in your mind the principles by which it is governed. Nothing delights youth so much as a clear and distinct knowledge of any branch of science which they are pursuing. And on the other hand, I know they are apt to be discouraged with any branch of learning which requires much time and attention to be understood. It is the evidence of a weak mind, however, to be discouraged by the obstacles with which the young learner must expect to meet, and the best means that you can adopt in order to enable you to overcome the difficulties that arise in the incipient stage of your studies is to cultivate the habit of thinking methodically and soundly on all subjects of importance which may engage your attention. That is the way Lincoln studied grammar, and I believe our students would greatly profit if they did likewise. Someone might object that Lincoln was gifted and that learning came easy for him, but let me quote what Lincoln himself said about the difficulty he had with his studies. My mind is like a piece of steel, very hard to scratch anything on it, almost impossible after you get it there to rub it out. The only difference, I think, between Lincoln and the rest of us is that we have just as hard a time scratching anything on our minds, but with us, it seems to roll out a lot easier. Before we move on, I want to read another passage from the introduction to this little book, and I can't help but wonder what went through Lincoln's mind when he read these very words early in his career, for they sound as though they were written especially for him. You are aware, my young friend, that you live in an age of light and knowledge, an age in which science and the arts are marching onward with gigantic strides. You live, too, in a land of liberty, 
a land on which the smiles of heaven beam with uncommon refulgence. The trump of the warrior and the clangor of arms no longer echo on our mountains or in our valleys. The garments dyed in blood have passed away. The mighty struggle for independence is over, and you live to enjoy the rich boon of freedom and prosperity which was purchased with the blood of our fathers. These considerations forbid that you should ever be so unmindful of your duty to your country, to your creator, to yourself, and to succeeding generations as to be content to grovel in, in ignorance. Remember that knowledge is power, that an enlightened and a virtuous people can never be enslaved, and that on the intelligence of our youth rests the future liberty, the prosperity, the happiness, the grandeur, and the glory of our beloved country. Go on, then, with a laudable ambition and an unyielding perseverance in the path which leads to honor and renown. Press forward. Go and gather laurels on the hill of science. Linger among her unfading beauties. Drink deep of her crystal fountain, and then join in the march of fame. Become learned and virtuous, and you will be great. Love God and serve Him, and you will be happy. With such a vision burning in his soul, is it any wonder that Lincoln rose to such greatness? Now to examine the writing process Lincoln followed in composing the Gettysburg Address. We have probably all heard the story that Lincoln wrote his speech on the back of an envelope while on the train to Gettysburg. However, that story is mere fiction. These immortal words did not come to Lincoln in a bolt out of the blue. Rather, they were the result of a very definite process which began months before he ever sat down with pen and paper. Ever since the Battle of Gettysburg, Lincoln had had something important he wanted to say to the country, brewing down on the inside of him. He understood, perhaps better than any other man of his time, what the war was all about. It wasn't just North against South. It wasn't to put down the rebellion or to free the slaves that men were fighting for. It was democracy itself that hung in the balance. The United States was not just a new nation, it was a new kind of nation, never before known in the history of mankind until 1776. Never before had men been afforded the freedom to govern themselves on such a large scale. Always it had been the lot of a privileged few, the aristocrats, to lord it over the masses of mankind until now. Thomas Jefferson had said early in our country's history, I have no fear but that the result of our experiment will be that men may be trusted to govern themselves without a master. But, alas, just fourscore and seven years later, the nation was embroiled in a bitter civil war, testing whether indeed men could govern themselves. The eyes of the whole world were upon us. One English observer noted, So short-lived has been the American Republic that those who saw it rise may live to see it fall. Lincoln had wanted to make it plain to his fellow countrymen just what was at stake in the war they were waging, and he was merely awaiting the right moment to do so. So we see that the first prerequisite for writing is to have something to say. Every teacher has heard the complaint, but I don't know what to write after giving a composition assignment. That is why it is important that students, especially in the beginning, be allowed to write about things they enjoy doing, or things they know about, such as a hobby or things they are familiar with firsthand. And that is why, as well, that preliminary research is so necessary before writing a report, so that students will have something to say when they begin to write. Lincoln had something to say, and when he received the invitation to speak at Gettysburg, he found the opportunity he had been waiting for. Then he began the process of setting his thoughts down on paper. First, he made notes of what he wanted to say. Lincoln was notorious for writing things down on cards and then filing them away in every nook and cranny, his favorite place being the inner band of his stovepipe hat, which doubled as his briefcase. Next, he wrote a rough draft of his speech from his notes. On the day before the Gettysburg trip, he showed it to his former Secretary of War, who recalled that it was written in pencil on the ordinary notebook paper. Third, he revised and revised and revised. In his room at Gettysburg on the eve of the ceremonies, he worked on his speech from 9 o'clock until midnight when he turned out the light. But even after he had delivered the speech the next day, Lincoln kept on revising. Over the next several months, he wrote out three other copies of the address, 
each containing changes which that did not appear in the original that he held in his hands at Gettysburg. We have come, had originally been, we are met. A portion of that field was at first a portion of it. Resting place for had been resting place of, and so on. In the end, Lincoln altered to one degree or another half of the speech's ten sentences. And it wasn't until 1895 that Congress finally decided which version would be considered official. The final version was chosen, being considered Lincoln's own last word on the subject. So we see that Lincoln followed a definite process in composing the Gettysburg Address, a process not unlike the one we urge on our students, uh, we urge our students to follow in writing their compositions. Now let us take a look at the speech itself to see if we can discover the secret of its greatness. First of all, note its form. We can see from just a glance at the paragraph arrangement how they grow larger and larger, that Lincoln is building up to a climax. And that is the basic pattern that all good writing should follow, a forceful introduction, a solid body, and a logical conclusion. Next, note its brevity. Only three paragraphs, ten sentences, 272 words altogether. Therein lies its strength, its compactness. Like Gideon's 300, Lincoln makes every word count, having weeded out all unnecessary words. Edward Everett, the keynote speaker that day at Gettysburg, later wrote to Lincoln, I should be glad if I could flatter myself that I came as near to the central idea of the occasion in two hours as you did in two minutes. Not only is it brief, but its language is simple and down to earth. Of the speech's 272 words, only seven are of four syllables, only 13 of three, only 50 are of two syllables, and the remaining 202 words are of just one syllable each. As one author described them, they are as plain and gray and beautiful as the weathered siding of old barns or rail fences. Lincoln takes these little commonplace words and weaves them into a beautiful tapestry, giving them a rhythm which is almost poetry. We are engaged in a great civil war. We are met on a great battlefield. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field. We cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow. Government of the people, by the people, for the people. Impressive rhythm. Also worthy of note is the ordering of the material in the speech. Lincoln begins with the past, the accomplishment of the forefathers, then moves to the present, the ceremonies at Gettysburg, and finally the future. This parallels the basic theme of the address, which is birth, death, and rebirth. But there is also a spatial ordering of the material. Beginning with the continent, he moves to the nation, then to the battlefield, and finally to a portion of the battlefield. Truly, this speech was the product of a master writer, a genius. The Gettysburg Address is great writing because it is timeless. It speaks to every generation of Americans, and it speaks to us here tonight. Tonight, the fate of our country hangs just as much in the balance as it did when Lincoln first uttered these words 133 years ago. Then it was a great civil war which tested whether this nation could long endure. But tonight, a great moral crisis threatens to destroy the very foundations of our society. No nation that has so provoked the Lord with its sins as America has has yet escaped his wrath. And unless things change, we will go the way of Rome, Greece, and Babylon. And if America falls, democracy will fall with it. And in the future, should the Lord carry, men will never again attempt to found a nation upon the principles of self-government, having once tried it and failed. America is at the crossroads. In the election this year, the American people will decide whether they want to continue down the path which leads to destruction or whether they want to turn around and begin to repair the crumbling foundations of our once great nation. So tonight, Lincoln again calls upon us to remember the great sacrifice of those who gave their lives at Gettysburg and on countless other battlefields since Gettysburg that this nation might live. Therefore, let us here tonight take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. Now, 
I must make it clear that I do not believe that it is God's will that Christians go to war on behalf of their country, or even to involve themselves in politics. However, I do believe that Christians have an obligation to pray for their country, and I believe that by praying we can render our country a more effective service than either ba the ballot or the bullet. During the Battle of Gettysburg, Lincoln went to his room and fell on his knees and began to pray more earnestly than he had ever prayed before. He acknowledged that God had given our people the best country ever given to man and that he alone could save it from destruction. He asked the Lord to give the Union victory and when he arose from prayer he felt certain that his prayer had been answered and it was. Today it would likewise appear that our nation is so far gone that only God can save it from destruction. Let us earnestly pray that he will again save our country and that government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth. Gottes